Would you get a chip implant in your brain from Gabe Newell? Valve and a different company Gabe and founded have been looking into brain computer technology to revolutionize science and gaming. A few days ago, they revealed a new chip they want to use for future implants. So here's everything you want to know from Valve testing out this tech in games to Gabe Newell's statements and details about his new chip. You may have heard of Gabe Newell's other company, Starfish Neuroscience, that's dedicated to advancing BCI technology. BCI, Brain Computer Interface Technology, lets your brain talk to a computer or device by reading your brain's electrical signals. It's like using your thoughts to control things. But rather than Valve, which is looking into BCI for gaming, Starfish Neuroscience is for more advanced practical uses, like using BCI for medical purposes specifically mentioning that they are deliberately casting a wide net to reach the greatest number of patients. Gabe is just a founder for Starfish, but they have a bunch of other talented people, like a former Valve employee, Alan Yates, who's worked on VR tech at Valve, like the Lighthouse system for Steam VR. Now, why we are talking about this and how it relates to Valve is because BCI tech isn't anything new for them, as they have been publicly talking about it since 2019, confirming that they have been trying out this tech as they believe it will revolutionize gaming. Of course, Starfish is medically related, but Gabe described BCI in an IGN interview in 2020 as bringing us closer to the matrix. You know, and like I was saying earlier, the brain computer interface stuff is, you know, we're way closer to the matrix than people realize, right? It's not going to be the matrix. The matrix is you know, a, a movie and it misses all the interesting technical subtleties and just how weird that the post brain computer interface world is going to be. But it's going to have a huge impact on the on the kinds of experiences that we can create for people. Uh, Predicting an extinction level event for traditional entertainment saying i think that it's an extinction level event for every entertainment form that's not thinking about this if you are in the entertainment business and you're not thinking about this you are going to be thinking about it a lot more in the future do you see a gaming tie into that or is it, is it a whole oh. separate uh sort of concern for you uh not concern interest uh, no, I think I think that it's an extinction level event for every entertainment form that's not thinking about this. Hmm. Uh, you know, if you're, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna change. If you're in the entertainment business and you're not thinking about this, you're go you're gonna be thinking about it a lot more in the future. In a different interview in 2021, Gabe envisioned BCI surpassing meat peripherals enabling games to adjust based on players' emotions and potentially editing perceptions. You know, it's indistinguishable from, from science fiction now. Our ability to create experience in people's brains that are not mediated through their meat peripherals will actually be better than uh, is possible. Like, So you're used to experiencing the world through eyes, but eyes were created by this low-cost bidder who didn't care about failure rates and, and RMAs, and if it got broken, there was no way to repair anything effectively. So. Newell also believes that brain chips could make games amazing. He said BCI could make virtual worlds feel better than real life by reading your thoughts and feelings. You know, it's like, totally makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, but is not at all, you know, reflective of consumer preferences. So the visual experience, the visual fidelity will be able to create through you know, the real world will stop being the metric that we apply to the best possible uh, visual fidelity. And instead it's like, the real world will seem flat, colorless, um, blurry, compared to the experiences that you'll be able to create in people's brains. So that's sort of like a simple way in which I think most, you know, it's like the matrix said, oh, and we'll create something that's like reality. And I think with BCIs, n fairly, quickly we'll be able to create experiences that are superior to what. Gabe also suggested BCI could edit personality traits and optimize sleep, citing his corneal transplant as evidence. Where it gets weird is when who you are becomes editable through a BCI, right? So like, oh, I'm feeling unmotivated today. Right now we think that that's like this fundamental personality characteristic that is relatively intractable to change and instead it'd be like oh i'm going to just turn up my focus right now i'm going to 
my mood should be this. Once you can start editing, you start having these feed forward and feedback loops in terms of who you want to be, which is a weird thing to talk about, right? I think it's an inevitable consequence of what I see happening with BCI, but it's, we don't, I don't even have the terminology yet to explain what the problem is concisely. I think you'll end up in situations where the kinds of experiences that you have will be complicated choices that you make. Right now, we know the, th the things that we like, but with BCI and with what's coming in terms of neuroscience, the, th the experiences that you have will now be things that are created and edited for you. Like one of the early applications I expect we'll see is improved sl sleep, right? It's like sleep will now become an app that you run where you're gonna like, oh, I need this much sleep, I need this much REM, and but it's now, you know, rather than, you know, I'll fluff my pillows this way and I'll like, you know, take, you know, Zolpidem to try to get myself to go to sleep. It's like, oh, I just say, this is how I want to sleep right now. And it, it looks like an app running on your phone rather than this complicated thing. And most people will look at that and go, that sounds pretty nice. You I mean, I got on this 12 hour plane and I basically said, I, want, I do not want to be awake for the next 12 hours. And I wake up completely refreshed with my circadian rhythm like right now, my humanness is adapting to my eye suddenly changing, right? Um, for a lot of people, it's gonna sound like, oh, this sounds scary and very different without realizing just how much who they are in these sort of basic perceptual motor kinds of functions already is, uh, is, is flexible. Bove is also working with OpenBCI on a headset called Galea. The Galia headset is a state-of-the-art wearable device designed to integrate neurotechnology with augmented and virtual reality. It enables brain-computer interface applications. Galia is one of the first, if not the first, available piece of technology that really closes the loop between humans and machines. It's a bi-directional brain-computer interface. Not only do we have the ability to record high fidelity physiological and psychological data from the human mind, but we also have the ability to right back into the human mind. Galia sensors combine EEG sensors for measuring brain activity from the scalp. There's EMG sensors that measure muscle movements and muscle activity. But we've also got things for heart rate, heart variability, respiration, and even eye tracking for measuring eye movements. So the problem that I have right now is picking which application you want to do, but there are tractable applications that you can tackle right now. Like if you look at VR headsets, any VR headset manufacturer is not at least getting up to speed on these technologies and figuring out how they could apply them. Like, uh, we're working on an open source project so everybody can have high resolution read technologies built into headsets uh, in, a, in a bunch of different modalities. And that's, like if you're a software developer in 2022 who doesn't have one of these in your test lab, you're making a silly mistake, right? So I think software development for for interactive experiences, absolutely, you'll, you'll be using one of these um, modified VR heads, head straps uh, to be doing that routinely, simply because it's, there's just too much useful data. In 2019, the same year Starfish Neuroscience was founded, a Valve employee, Mike, who is an experimental psychologist, held an hour-long keynote talking about this exact subject and the future of gaming with brain-computer interfaces. He first points out the limitations of current gaming interfaces, issues like input mapping, latency, bandwidth, and reliance on player memory. Um, so you know, again, we're mapping intent on screen output. Um, we're doing it with reasonable latency. Uh, you have to think a thought and translate it into a, a finger movement or a hand movement or a wrist movement. Um, we have restricted bandwidth. We can only do so much at once. Uh, how many different keys can you press at once? Um, we're starting to add a widening array of input patterns and we are getting more naturalistic movements. Right? And these are great, right? Like they, they, they work for current generation games and that's fine. But the, the, I guess the question I'd like to ask you guys is what happens if we didn't have to use them? How would you imagine an ideal interface? Mike positions BCIs as a game changer, noting they could provide quicker responses, a broader range of inputs, complex input patterns, and additional information from the player. By translating neural signals into actionable commands, or capturing physiological data to gauge a player's internal state. So, you know, interfaces can respond quicker. 
uh, that could allow a much broader space of possible input commands. Uh, we could have complex patterns of input. We could have chains. Think about you know, doing thing, oh, I want to undo the last thing I did and rotate this thing that I did and whatnot. Um, we could also maybe get additional axes of information from the player. And so I want to drill into this one, and this is going to be the focus of the talk. Right. With, with BCIs, we can make progress on all, all of the, I guess, the, the top four um, ways we can potentially improve, inter improve, well, potentially improve interfaces. But what I'm really curious about, or what I'm really fascinated by, is what happens when we get additional data from the player we're not getting with current generation interfaces. So what could we do if we had more or different kinds of information from the player? Right? This, is the question, this is the question that kind of motivates this research. What about all the data we're missing from the player's experience? Right? We know what players are trying to do in game for the most part. We know if they're jumping or reloading or selecting a character, right? Or trying to attack. But we don't know how they're experiencing it. So are they happy or are they sad? Are they engaged or are they detached? Are they challenged or are they bored? Are they frustrated or curious? Are they exploring or solving puzzles or goofing off or playing seriously? Are they learning something new? Are they learning something old? Are they distracted? Are they remembering something? Are they speaking to a friend? Are they getting angrier? Are they getting happier? Right? So do we actually need any of this? You know, maybe not, but I, I would like to find out. I guess like, like a hypothesis I'm going to make in this talk is that we would get an improved player experience and a qualitatively different player experience if we had access to internal states and emotions and cognitions and decisions. And so I hope at the end of this talk, you can kind of see at least why I believe this and maybe you might feel similarly. He envisions BCIs transforming gaming in three ways, enhancing playtesting, enabling adaptive gameplay, and possibly replacing traditional controllers entirely. Mike dreams of a future where gameplay is no longer one size fits all, it's tailored to the player. It's no longer a game for everyone, it's a game for you. Right, just as players respond to the game, games can start to respond to the player. If these are the kinds of gameplay experiences you like, well, we can start to give you more of them, less of the ones you don't. Right? Games will start to learn how players want to play their games. And as a consequence, gameplay becomes adaptive and personalized. We start modifying aspects of the game, the difficulty, the you know, individual components of the gameplay, the rewards, the teammates, the weapons you get. We change the visuals, the sound, the interfaces. All of this can adapt to what you're feeling and experiencing. Right, so gameplay is no longer one size fits all. It's tailored to the player. It's no longer a game for everyone. It's a game for you. Yet he also acknowledges some hurdles like neuroscience gaps, noisy data, hardware costs, and privacy concerns, asking, what if BCIs are not a necessity? What if BCIs are not a necessity? What if players don't see benefit? What if we as developers can come up with ways to take advantage of having insight into internal state? Like, I, I do believe I, I can see clearly how this would happen. Like, I, I laid out you know, a variety of ways I thought we could you know, get better data from playtesting and design gameplay experiences that don't exist. But I absolutely could be wrong, right? This is theory. I'm describing things in the abstract, and it's easy to make things in the abstract sound cool. While full BCI integration might be decades off, he remains hopeful, concluding, in the future, I very much hope this is how we play. He even showed off an alien swarm experiment they did behind the scenes. Here's a screenshot from Valve's best known game, Alien Swarm. Uh, came out a while ago, it's a top down shooter, awesome game, a lot of fun to play. Uh, this is an experiment we did a while ago where we used physiological signals, physiological arousal as an input to the game. We gave you uh, four minutes to kill 100 enemies and the timer would tick down quicker if you got more aroused, if you got more excited, uh, which would then cause you to get even more excited and then it would take down even quicker. And so you get a negative feedback loop. And so, uh, you know, it's one design that may or may not actually end up being suitable for, for consumption, but you can start thinking about novel kinds of gameplay experiences when physiological data becomes an input, a direct input to the game. Imagine a spy game where you actually have to be a spy and fool people with your voice, your words, your behavior and your thoughts. Uh, and we get to design games that are adaptive. Uh, that's probably covers a lot. I probably should have made that, like use a larger font for that point, but hopefully I've made the case as to why I think that's interesting. And the same for replacements for traditional interfaces, right? The end game, um, new kinds of experiences become possible.
So when can all of this happen? Well, we actually have to start doing the work, but we can start making progress on playtesting and adaptive gameplay now. Adaptive games might take a, a few years to get going, but we can start the process now. And then interface replacements, well, again, people are working on things now, but uh, could be very, very far away. So I don't know exactly when all of this will take place, but what I do know is that in the future, I very much hope this is how we play. So thank you very much. Now, why we are talking about all this is because in a recent blog posted on May 20th, 2025, Starfish revealed a new chip for miniaturized ultra-low power electrophysiology. They are building a tiny energy-saving chip for brain research that could change how we understand and treat the brain. Current brain devices are big and use a lot of power, but Starfish wants to make something small, smart, and wireless. The current problem though is that most brain tools today focus on just one part of the brain. However, many brain problems involve multiple areas working together incorrectly. Current devices are too bulky and power hungry to fix this. So this is where Starfish wants to develop a new class of minimally invasive distributed neural interfaces that enable simultaneous access to multiple brain regions. They are working to build new technologies that allow for the recording and stimulation of neural activity with a level of precision vastly exceeding what is possible with current available systems. A key aspect of this is reducing the surgical burden of device implementation, in part by reducing the implant size. So that's where they revealed their new chip. The features of this new chip include its tiny size and low power, which is perfect for implants. It records brain activity and stimulates it with 32 connection spots, handles 16 channels at once, and processes data right on the chip. It also works with low bandwidth wireless systems, so no big wires or batteries are needed. They also state, we designed this chip with the intent of future integration into a fully wireless, battery-free implant. Therefore, it has the flexibility to work under different power or data constraints. For example, amplifiers can be disabled to save power, and communications interfaces are flexible enough to support easy integration with most microcontrollers. At the same time, we are also actively developing tiny low-power electronics and expect to have more to share on that progress in the future. We anticipate our first chips arriving in late 2025 and we are interested in finding collaborators for whom such a chip would open new and exciting avenues. Now, of course, Starfish Neuroscience is not Valve, but we know Valve has been exploring brain-computer interface technology for years now to revolutionize gaming. The details in Starfish's recent blog post about their custom chip directly align with Valve's vision for immersive, thought-controlled gaming experiences, where they want to make a chip for multiple uses. So with shared leadership through Gabe Newell, and a clear overlap in technological goals, this chip could play a pivotal role in advancing Valve as well. So what are your thoughts on having a chip in your brain that could control and change how you play video games? Of course, there are already things like this out there like Neuralink, where some are already gaming on Counter-Strike, but this has a completely different goal, where not only can you play with your brain, but you would also be able to adjust game difficulty based on your emotions. If anyone would advance gaming to this technical level, it would be Gabe Newell and Valve. So with Gabe also being a co-founder of this science company that works on this exact same thing, there definitely is a connection there. So would you get an implant of this Gaben chip in your brain?